uh, the research I've been working on. All right. Um, so I will be talking today about my master's research, which is titled The Stock Discrimination of Lake Sturgeon in the Lake Winnebago System Using Otolith and Finray Microchemistry. I want to start off by thanking my committee, Dana Iserman, Dan Demkowski, Hal Herman, and Margaret Stadig. And I'd also like to acknowledge that all of the funding for this project <clears throat> was provided by the Wisconsin DNR through the Lake Winnebago System Sturge and Spearing Tags. So without DNR and without those spears and without my committee, uh, we wouldn't have any of this research. So thank you to everyone. All right, I tried to progress. Okay, it's not letting me, oh, I see. All right, apologies. All right, so let's start by talking about uh, my study species, lake sturgeon. Uh, many populations of lake sturgeon are in recovery. Some of these populations support fishing, but few of them actually support harvest. The goal of many recovery efforts is to provide future fishing opportunities. Um, however, the species is vulnerable to overfishing because a long lifespan, late maturity, and low recruitment make it difficult for the species to recover after unsustainable mortality rates. <clears throat> and thus, a sustainable fishery requires careful management of the species. So the study area is the Lake Winnebago system. Uh, this system supports one of the largest self-sustaining lake sturgeon populations in North America and is a harvested population. This system is a riverine lake watershed located in East Central Wisconsin. It is composed of Lake Winnebago, the largest inland lake in the state, the upriver lakes, which are Butamore, Winnicani, and Poygan, and four main tributaries, the Upper Fox River, the Little Wolf River, and the Embarrass River. I apologize. Um, I'm gonna pause just for a second because I keep getting all these things pop up on my screen as people are joining. So let me see if I can change that. All right. All right, so within the Lake Winnebago system, lake sturgeon are harvested through a spearing season that occurs every year in February. The season lasts up to 16 days or until the WDNR harvest caps are met. There are separate harvest caps for the upriver lakes and then for Lake Winnebago on its own. Uh, only one sturgeon can be harvested each year per licensed spearer and all harvested fish must be registered at a registration station after they're harvested. So at these registration stations, each fish is evaluated using several metrics. Length and weight are measured. The sex and reproductive stage are determined for each fish. The fish is scanned for previous tags and fin rays are collected for age estimation. <clears throat> so while the data collected through harvesting reporting are critical for sturgeon management, these data don't actually provide DNR insight into where these fish hatch and recruit into the harvested population. So there are many unknowns when it comes to lake sturgeon recruitment in the Lake Winnebago system, which this study aimed to address. What we did know is that the fish spawn at many locations in the tributaries across the system. What was unknown is whether larvae or juveniles are produced within each tributary. What was also unknown is how each tributary might contribute to this spearing fishery. Addressing these unknowns is important because the effects of harvest could vary among the stocks. So, to provide a tool for future lake sturgeon recruitment studies in the Lake Winnebago system, we sampled larval and juvenile lake sturgeon. We used drift nets to sample the larvae. This method is frequently used to capture them in other systems, but was previously rarely done on the Lake Winnebago system and had never been done before on some of the tributaries. And spotlight surveys were used to sample for juveniles, which is done in other Wisconsin rivers. And the picture you see here, that is a juvenile or an H0 
sturgeon. So furthermore, we aim to use these juveniles for stock discrimination in this system through otolith microchemistry. So what are otoliths? Otoliths are inner ear bones which aid in hearing and balance. They're composed primarily of calcium carbonate and they absorb microelements in the fish's environment. They are acellular. And so once a layer is made, it does not get absorbed back into the body and it stays in the otolith. Since they show the stability, they can be used to show an elemental history of the various environments where the fish has lived throughout its life. The general idea behind my study was that if the elemental signatures vary among the tributaries in the Lake Winnebago system, we'd be able to use the chemical signatures in otoliths for stock discrimination to identify the natal origins of lake sturgeon in the system. Unfortunately, obtaining the otoliths requires sacrificing the fish, which makes this process a lethal one. And since otoliths are not available for all sturgeon populations, like they are in the Lake Winnebago system, as fish sacrifice is not conducive to their recovery, thin ray microchemistry might provide a non-lethal alternative for identifying natal origins of these fish. Thin rays are already commonly collected from many sturgeon for age estimation, and the sturgeon registration in the Lake Winnebago system provides a unique opportunity to collect both otoliths and thin rays. And thus, my objectives were to determine if larval relative abundance varies among spawning locations in the Lake Winnebago system. This information will be used to inform future habitat management of these areas. Next, we wanted to determine whether otolith microchemistry can be used to discriminate among age zero lake sturgeon residing in rivers where spawning occurs. We also wanted to determine if chemical signatures in fin rays cluster fish in a similar manner to otolith signatures. And lastly, we aim to determine whether contribution to spearing harvest determined from microchemistry analyses varies among the rivers in the system. So what are the methods I use to evaluate those objectives? <clears throat> to evaluate Larval relative abundance, we collected larvae in the Lake Winnebago system. The peak larval drift model that we used is based on when spawning occurred as well as water temperature trends. And this allowed us to predict when we needed to um, sample for these larvae. We sampled all four main tributaries in the system from mid-May to early June and to 2019 and 2020. Sampling was done at four known spawning locations using D-frame drift nets, which were set after dusk and allowed to soak in the river for about two and a half to three hours. We originally attempted to extract otoliths from the larval fish for microchemical analysis, but had to discontinue this as the small size of the otoliths makes extraction very difficult. And here I just want to give you an idea of what the larval sampling sites look like. This is the Fox River at Princeton, the Little Wolf River at Manoa Dam, the Embarrass River at Pfeiffer Park, and then the Wolf River at Shawano Dam. <clears throat> so we measured relative larval abundance in catch per effort or CPE per site which is the total larvae captured divided by the total time the nets spent in the water or total net hours. This was split up by sampling occasion, or in other words, a night of sampling. To analyze those CPE data, I first determined that the data were non-normally distributed. I attempted several data transformations, but was unable to achieve normality. So non-parametric tests were used to further evaluate the data. The questions we aim to answer here were whether relative larval abundance varied between years and whether it varied among sites. So to evaluate our microchemistry based objectives, we first looked at water chemistry. The underlying assumption is that rivers where fish live vary in water chemistry. And so we aim to find out whether this is true within the Lake Winnebago system. 
we took samples at 10 tributary locations and took three replicate samples at each of these sites. We collected samples in 2017 and then again in 2020 to evaluate the temporal variability of water chemistry within the tributaries. The resulting microelemental concentrations were converted to molar concentrations. Then the ratios of each element in relation to calcium were calculated. And calcium is used as the baseline in this study because otoliths are composed primarily of calcium carbonate. These elemental ratios were then averaged by site, and these mean elemental ratios were normalized via scaling. Then the mean elemental ratios for barium, magnesium, manganese, and strontium in relation to calcium were run through a principal components analysis or a PCA. This analysis reduced uses the dimensionality of a large multi-dimensional data set and allows us to visualize in two dimensions how the samples relate to each other. A PCA also ranks the variables, or here, the mean elemental ratios, by the relative contribution they make to the overall analysis. So after looking at water chemistry, we needed to see how that translates into fish structure microchemistry. If you recall, we were unable to collect otoliths from larvae because of their small size. However, lake sturgeon reside in these rivers for several months after they hatch, and it is much easier to extract otoliths from these larger fish, so these juveniles became the baseline for our microchemistry study. Juveniles were collected before outmigration, out which means they were still within the first year of their life. The goal was to collect from all four main tributaries, the Wolf, Little Wolf, Fox, and Embarrass Rivers. For collection, spotlight surveys were conducted in the late summer and early fall in 2018 and in 2019. So to collect our adult samples, we utilized the registration stations during the 2018 and 2019 spearing seasons. These fish were harvested both from the upriver lakes and Lake Winnebago. Fin rays were collected from every fish at the registration stations, as I mentioned previously. And then the otoliths came from a subsample of those fish for which the heads were returned as voluntary submissions from spearers. For the heads, spearers were given an ID tag to link these returned heads to corresponding fin rays. Samples were distributed between sexes, across link fins, and among the harvest zones to get a representative representative sample of the population. We then removed sagittal otoliths and a pectoral fin ray from juveniles and the otoliths from the adults. We removed sagittal otoliths because they are the most commonly used in these types of studies and are the largest pair, making them easier to work with. The diameter of all juvenile structures was measured and then the minimum diameter for each structure type served as the length of the core region to be analyzed in the adult structures. These samples were then mounted to slides with cyanoacrylate cement, which is just a fancy word for super glue. And then they were cleaned with ultra pure water to help eliminate possible contamination prior to microchemical analysis. And then the microchemical analysis was conducted via laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, or LAICPMS, to quantify the microelemental signatures in the otoliths and the fin rays. Analysis was done at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research <clears throat> at the University of Windsor and at the LAICPMS laboratory at the University of Manitoba. From the ablation analysis, we obtained isotopic counts in counts per second for each sample. And in subsequent data analysis, all observations that were below the limit of detection were removed. So to analyze our microchemical data, I converted those isotopic counts to elemental counts using the natural abundance of each isotope. I then calculated the elemental ratios in relation to calcium 
took an average of each ratio per sample and normalized these mean elemental ratios through scaling. Then these mean elemental ratios were run through a PCA for each group of data, for example, a dollar list that is one group of data or one data set. The same elements that went into the water chemistry PCA went into the structure microchemistry PCAs, which are barium, magnesium, manganese, and strontium in relation to calcium. And also all outliers were removed from the adult data. <clears throat> I also conducted cluster analyses in order to distinguish stocks from each other within groups of data. I used the k-means aggregation method and a pool of 30 indices to select the optimal number of clusters for each data set. This analysis is a used to uh, assign individuals to cluster groups. The data sets analyzed were both from unknown natal origins, i.e. the adults, and then from known natal origins, so being our juvenile um, lake sturgeon. Adult otoliths were analyzed via cluster analysis, and sometimes we were able to analyze both an otolith and a fin ray from the same fish. From here forward, these will be referred to as paired structures. We clustered adult paired structures to assess consistency between structure types. And then juvenile otoliths and fin rays were also clustered as were the juvenile paired structures. So what did we learn from all of this? <clears throat> so larvae were collected at all of our sites except the Fox River at Princeton. Um, all other sites are within the Wolf River drainage. And a recent study showed hatching success in the Wolf River drainage, but not in the Fox River drainage. Um, this table on the slide here shows relative larval abundance in mean catch per net hour for sampling occasion or another sampling. And then again, that catch per net hour is just another term for our CPE. <clears throat> the N equals is um, shows the total number of individuals captured at each site in each year and then overall in that last column. And due to the absence of larvae on all sampling occasions in the Fox River at Princeton, this site was excluded from further analyses. So relative larval abundance did not differ between years and it did not differ among sites. And again, that Fox River Princeton site is excluded from these, these plots and these analyses. So now we'll look at the results of all our chemical analyses, starting with water. So this plot here is an ordination diagram of the water chemistry PCA. The red arrows sort of in the center are the variable axes which show how the elemental ratios relate to the samples and to each other. Among the samples, we see separate groupings between the fox and the wolf drainages, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to see my cursor here. So this is sort of our fox grouping, and then this is our wolf grouping here. All right, and then this plot shows the relative contributions each variable or elemental ratio um, made to the distribution of the samples within the PCA, and they are from left to right in order of relative importance. That dashed reference line at the top is the expected value of each contribution if the contributions were uniform. So here, since we have four variables or four PCs, that's 25% each. The elemental ratios that exceeded the dashed line can be considered important to the PCA. So here, that would be manganese, barium, and magnesium in relation to calcium. So here is the ordination diagram for the PCA for juvenile otoliths. Um, we did not capture any Fox River juvenile fish. Um, in addition to not capturing any larvae. Throughout all of our 
surveys. So in the juvenile data, we only have Wolf River Basin samples. Here we see an overlap among all rivers of origin. So you can see that sort of those ovals um, denote the different rivers of origin and they all sort of kind of overlap each other. And therefore, we cannot chemically distinguish wolf basin fish from each other. And the important elemental ratios here were strontium and barium in relation to calcium. And then so for our cluster analysis, this plot shows um, the results of that analysis. And um, what we're looking for is the peak. So this peak shows the optimal number of clusters, um, which here is four. So basically what this means is um, these juvenile otoliths were grouped into four groups. And then this plot takes those data and it groups all the individuals among the juvenile otoliths into those four clusters that were indicated. Within these clusters, we actually have a mix of individuals from different rivers, except for cluster four in that bottom left corner, which is just one individual on its own. Uh, the river of origin is shown by the sample name. So if you kind of look at the clusters, um, the first letters indicate the river of origin. So names starting with LW, as you can see right here, that's a little wolf river fish. WR indicates wolf river and EMB indicates embarrassed river fish. And since we saw this mixing of individuals from different rivers within the clusters, as opposed to a separation of clusters by river of origin, then the cluster assignments obviously are not dictated by their river of origin. <clears throat> and then here we see the plot for the PCA of juvenile fin rays. Again, there are no Fox River samples among these samples. Um, the embarrassed river fish, which is this kind of big circle here, overlap both the wolf and the little wolf samples. And therefore, like with the juvenile otoliths, we cannot chemically distinguish wolf basin fish from each other. And the important elemental ratios here were strontium and magnesium in relation to calcium. So the optimal number of clusters within the juvenile fin rays was three. Here, the number of clusters matches the number of rivers of origin. However, those three clusters each contain a mix of individuals from the different rivers, and therefore the cluster assignments are not dictated by river of origin here either. And so to assess the consistency in clustering between structure types, we will now look at paired juvenile otolith clustering followed by paired juvenile fin rate clustering. In the juvenile otoliths um, paired structures, we see that the optimal number of clusters is six. And in contrast, the optimal number of clusters in the paired juvenile fin rays is three. So since we saw inconsistent clustering between juvenile structure types, we can conclude that these fish, the fin rays do not show the same clustering as the otoliths do. So now let's switch over to looking at our adult structure microchemistry. This is also an ordination diagram of the PCA done for adult otoliths, um, as opposed to the other ordination diagrams you've been seeing with the colored points. Since these all fish are from unknown origins, that's why we just see them as numbers instead of as groups with different um, color de designations. And the important elemental ratios among the adult otoliths were barium, strontium, and manganese in relation to calcium. The cluster analysis of the adult otoliths indicated that the optimal number of clusters was two. And this plot grouping these individuals into two clusters shows that there's no overlap between the clusters, which is indicative of two distinct groups. 
As an additional assessment of the consistency in clustering between otoliths and fin rays, we will look at the paired adult otoliths and fin rays. So the cluster analysis here indicated two as the optimal number of clusters and the optimal number of clusters in paired adult fin rays was also two. So in the adult paired structures, we did see consistent clustering between the structure types. To evaluate this further, we use the best partition list from each cluster analysis to extract the cluster composition, which basically just shows which cluster each individual was assigned to. And among those, only 46.3% were actually assigned to the same cluster when comparing otoliths and fin rays. And therefore, fin rays do not cluster individuals in the same way otoliths do in our adult data. So now let's talk about what these results mean. <clears throat> the larval relative abundance did not vary significantly among spawning locations, which ties back to objective one. Lake sturgeon hatched successfully at spawning sites in, Wolf, in the Wolf River drainage, but not at the Princeton um, site in the off, Upper Fox River. This appears to be due to factors influencing eggs after deposition. Notable factors among these are siltation and periphyton biomass in the Fox River, as identified in that recent study. Larval catch rates were low compared to previous studies, except in Tucker et al.'s recent study in the lower Fox River. This could indicate poor hatching success and low larval survival, or this could be due to differences in spawning locations, larval sampling design, and sampling effectiveness among the studies. In my study, sites other than Shano Dam were small and attracted few adult sturgeon compared to other Wolf River Basin sites and compared to previous studies. And water chemistry showed separate groups between the fox and the wolf drainages, and the main stem wolf river had water chemistry similar to its tributaries. So adult otolith and fin ray microchemistry indicated two groups among the fish speared from the Lake Winnebago system. Groupings were not consistent between structures, which addresses objective three. The two group model we saw is consistent with the grouping seen in our water chemistry, which suggests a chemical difference between the fox and wolf drainages. However, adult otolith chemistry does not align with the water chemistry. We saw this by comparing the important elemental ratios in each data set, which in water were manganese, barium, and magnesium, and in adult otoliths were barium, strontium, and manganese. And again, those are in order of importance. Since no juveniles were collected from the Fox River, we could not determine a baseline for evaluating whether the two groups seen in the adult structure chemistry represents adults originating from the Wolf and the Fox River drainages. And this ties back to objectives two and four. And so now let's wrap everything up. Um, so very, very few lake sturgeon go to the Fox River to spawn and there are very low egg densities there. Habitat conditions in the Fox River may not be conducive to egg survival. The recently concluded study assessed habitat characteristics in the Lake Winnebago system and concluded that siltation and periphyton biomass in the Fox River may influence hatching success. Our water chemistry results suggest that otolith and fin ray microchemistry may be used to identify natal origins of Lake Winnebago system lake sturgeon on a basin-wide scale, or in other words, Wolf River Basin versus Fox River Basin. The important elements were inconsistent between the water and the structures, and we would need Fox River juvenile sturgeon or surrogate species as a baseline to investigate this further. Genetic approaches may offer an alternative to microchemical methods, but this would rely on the relatedness of the individuals rather than stock discrimination, which was the goal of this study. So with that, I'd like to thank the many people that were involved in this project. Um, many more people beyond 
those that are listed here were either involved in the project itself or supported me um, both in school and personally. I'd also like to give special thanks to my friends and family for all their support throughout this process. And with that, I'll take any questions anyone might have. All right, we do have time for questions. I see uh, if you get, if somebody wants to raise their hand, I'm gonna try to figure out how to, I'd like to unmute everybody and then have them be able to talk, but I can't see how to do that. So if you have a question, if you wanna use your that raise hand symbol, I can unmute you individually, I think. Actually, getting some applause. Yeah, and the committee members will have lots of time. All right, I'm going to try to, I'm going to let Colleen ask a question. Okay. Hey, Jasmine, can you hear me? I can. Oh, it was good to see such a great presentation and uh, see how you finished up a wonderful career and you know, now you're moving on to even a better one. So I, I really appreciate you asking me to come and view it. I thought your odalis were quite interesting. I noticed that, and maybe because of the size, they don't have rings. Do you start, start to not put down concentric rings? That is an excellent question. So for any of my non-fishy folks out there, otoliths are sort of like trees in that when you cut them open, you see rings that um, denote each year that the organism has been alive. And yes, they do have rings. Um, so in that picture, which wasn't the best picture, you can't really see it. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. So here's an adult otolith. <laughs> um, you can kind of see a little bit of annuli here, the rings that Colleen was talking about. But yes, they, they do have rings. Um, they're not great for age estimation, though. Lake sturgeon, um, otoliths, and fin rays. Um, there was a recent study by another one of um, Dan Iserman's students who concluded that they they just are very difficult to read. Um, so while they do have rings, they're they're just really not as useful as the rings in other um, in the otoliths and other species. Okay, so so both neither neither otoliths nor thin rays um, will allow you to see age or understand movement. I guess is is your final. Uh, suggesting that fin rays, since they don't show the same sort of cluster analysis as otoliths, we can't use fin rays as a non-lethal technique to kind of figure out where these fish are moving and why they're moving. Is that right? According to this study, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very important question. Thank you. And I just wanted to um, clarify, you know, for some people. So the reason that otoliths are, you know, require that you kill the fish and fin rays don't is otoliths are a bone inside the head. And um, fin rays, the ones that we were taking specifically were from kind of their shoulder area. And then you just kind of cut a piece of the um, sort of, I guess, the underlying structure of the fin and then the fish can move on and continue with its life and be fine. Yeah, I, I would say like collectively, otoliths and fin rays might be all right for estimating the age of younger sturgeon, like maybe under 20 years of age. Um, but that can be tricky when we're using spearing as a recovery, because a lot of those fish are, there's a 36 inch minimum, I think is the, the minimum length limit. So a lot of those fish are beyond that range of ages where we would want to be able to estimate them. The the real value has come from using the pit tag recoveries that the DNR has a really robust pit tagging program that they've been doing for quite a while. And um, some of my other students, um, including Jeremiah, who's here on the call, we've been using the pit tags to estimate growth and, and survival rather than relying on the calcified structures. Those are things that um, happened after Jasmine 
left us to head back to New Mexico, so... All right, well, I'm not seeing any other hands. Oh, Colleen, you you just, did you raise your hand again? <laughs> I'll, I'll see if it was, might just be the first. No, one. no, I didn't. Okay. I'll lower my hand up. All right, no problem. Good job, Jazzy. Thanks, Colleen. 